Hi everybody and thank you for watching this. This video is answering your questions about uh, what happens hormonally and what happens symptomatically during the menstrual cycle. Uh, so I posted this question on my social media, on Facebook, on Instagram, and um, I got a load of questions both on the posts, but also in my DMs and via email, which was quite interesting because um, this is not shaming anybody for doing that, but there's still a lot of stigma and embarrassment about menstrual health. And I think it's only by normalizing these conversations that we can make any change with this. You know, 50% of people on the planet are going to have a period. And I think it is important to say people are going to have a period because yes, we're primarily used to thinking about women having periods, but trans men get periods too. And we want to just be inclusive and make sure that anybody who is having a period feels seen and feels heard and that we're, we're super inclusive with our approach. Um, just a quick review of the menstrual cycle. We will be covering this in depth in future videos, but let me just see if we can show you here without too much of, sorry, I forgot to bring paper. Okay, so we start with day, day one of the cycle. Now, this of course is super shiny. There we go, we'll, we'll figure it out. Day one of the cycle is when you start bleeding and all of the lovely graphics that you will see um, are based on a 28 day cycle. Uh, and the, the general regard that that is the norm. However, less than half of all people who menstruate have a classic 28 day cycle, but it's super easy for the diagrams and we can mark in day 14 as ovulation. So remember that you're, you know, a cycle can be anywhere from 21 to 38 days. Um, it's about what's normal for you. It's about um, monitoring what's normal for you and keeping track of any changes. Have there been huge changes in the length of your cycle? Are they getting shorter? Are you skipping cycles? Um, you know, maybe a couple of months you don't have a period and then they come back again. Remember, menopause is 12 months without a period. But if you are, um, if you are younger than 45, we really want to keep track of this for our athletes particularly because I don't know that there's enough awareness of the fact that skipping your period, particularly if you're training really heavily, is not a good sign. That's going to be strongly related to your nutrition and your energy awareness, which of course is going to affect your performance and your picking up injuries. So more about that in future videos, of course, as well. But anyway, here we go. So we've got our menstrual cycle. So I'm going to I'll do a little printable to go along with this so you can see in the blog post exactly what I'm talking about. If I can just keep it really still here, we might get away with it. OK, so day one, we start bleeding. Most people, three to five days of bleeding. So this is the early follicular phase. We track your cycle from the first day of bleeding. That's day one. OK, and not spotting, but actually bleeding, proper bleeding. So we're going to move through here and what's happening, the two hormones that we're particularly interested here are estrogen and progesterone. Those are the two rock stars. There are so many other hormones involved with this as well, but those are the two that we're really going to be focusing on because they drive a lot of what we're interested in for the purpose of this video particularly. So what you can see here is we're bleeding, the lining is breaking down and being shed. As we move through this phase, the first half of the cycle is your follicular phase and this is where the follicle is maturing so it's called the follicular phase and we see follicle stimulating hormone stimulating the follicle in the follicular phase you get where i'm going with this so estrogen and progesterone are both really low at the start here and as we move through this follicular phase you can see estrogen in yellow here and progesterone in blue Progesterone is going to stay quite low during this follicular phase, but estrogen starts to rise as we come up towards ovulation. And you can see the follicle is maturing here as well. So ovulation, if you have a 28 day cycle, you're probably going to be ovulating around day 14. So you keep track of, of your temperature, your basal temperature, first thing in the morning when you wake up. 
and that dips when you ovulate. You can also keep track of your cervical mucus when it gets kind of like an egg white. Um, that's a sign that you're ovulating as well. So day 14, ovulating, estrogen is quite high. Then we move into the luteal phase. And this is where the corpus luteum, once the follicle you know, has matured, the egg has been released, the corpus luteum releases progesterone. And that's, it's super important that we do ovulate because that's our main source premenopausally of progesterone. So the adrenal glands sitting on top of your kidneys make a small amount, but this is where the action is after we ovulate. So in this luteal phase, the second two weeks after you ovulate, you have progesterone rising and then it falls if you're not pregnant. Estrogen also goes up again around day 21 to 23, again, of your 28 day cycle. If you're not pregnant, they both fall just before you start bleeding again. And then we're back here at day one. Okay, so it's important that we're all kind of starting from the same understanding of what day one of your cycle actually is. It's day one of bleeding. Um, and again, based on a 28 day cycle with ovulation at around uh, day 14, you don't have to depend on taking a temperature or dropping an iPad. Uh, taking a temperature, or looking at cervical mucus, you can buy ovulation test kits. So I got so many questions. I'm going to pick maybe three or four and see about answering those. And maybe we'll come back again. Maybe we'll have frequently asked Fridays and I'll go through the rest of these questions. And that way, if you think of any more, you can let me know. OK, question one. Um, a lot of questions about bowels and hormones and how they react together. Uh, why do I get diarrhea day one or day two and I'm more windy? during my period? Um, so that's a really great question. And the answer, of course, the answer for most of these questions will be because of your hormones, primarily. So as we were going through that luteal phase, um, remember day 14, we ovulate, the egg is released, and then the corpus luteum is breaking down and giving us a surge of progesterone during those second two weeks, the luteal phase of our cycle. So progesterone, acts as a uterine relaxant because it's trying to help prepare this lovely environment if you're pregnant for the baby to grow. So the uterus is relaxing, it's expanding, estrogen is helping build up that lining as well and you're not pregnant so you're going to shed that lining. So what happens is as you start to release the lining your uterine lining is also going to re release prostaglandins. So prostaglandins are like the opposite of progesterone. So progesterone relaxes the uterus, prostaglandins help it contract. Okay, so what does that mean? Here we have, so bladder, uterus, and rectum here at the back. Okay, if the uterus is releasing prostaglandins, they can also affect the rectum in the same way that progesterone relaxing the smooth muscles slowing down digestive motility so you might be a little bit more prone to things like constipation in the second half of your cycle you might be prone to increased appetite in the second half of your cycle increased progesterone can do that because again it's preparing you in case you're pregnant so you might notice that appetite goes up a little bit um, constipation might be happening as well. And then coming up to literally just, you know, the day or so before your period, estrogen and progesterone drop. This might be where, you know, you're going to think about getting some cravings. We'll talk about the cravings in a sec. Let's just focus on the diarrhea and the prostaglandins. So progesterone drops, uterus starts to shed its lining making it contract really hard. Remember, the uterus is probably the strongest muscle that we have in the body. It's shaking, it's uh, contracting really hard to do a Taylor Swift and shake off the lining. But those prostaglandins can irritate both the bladder, but especially the rectum. And they cause everything to contract, speed up transit through, cause a little bit of diarrhea. The windiness, so the bit of flatulence that you might notice during the first day or two, could also be driven by the prostaglandins. 
but also in the day or so before and the first few days of your period, as you start moving into that follicular phase again, your estrogen levels are also going to be quite low. And remember, estrogen um, is one of our continence mechanisms and there's loads of um, estrogen receptors around the opening to the anus. So particularly if you are perimenopausal, and kind of that's the trend that things are taking. Anyway, estrogen receptors are not getting the estrogen that they need. So they, the sphincters might be a little bit less efficient. So you couple that with a bit of digestive upset caused by the prostaglandins and lower estrogen may be um, inhibiting that closure mechanism. And that's why you might find that you're a little bit more gassy during your period. So hopefully that's helpful. What are you going to do about it? Think about what food drives faster transit through the bowel. So think fruit, um, which is great if you're constipated, but if you're prone to diarrhea, you might just want to cut back on the fruit for those few days um, and maybe stick with veg. Um, coffee. Coffee is a bowel stimulant as well. So that's going to, um, again, increase transit through. So think about things that are irritating, maybe spicy foods, possibly dairy also. And those might be food groups that you want to stay away from in those days coming up to your period. Um, find out, I am just such a big believer in N equals one, um, because as we'll talk about in future videos, the research even around sport and performance and menstrual cycles, it's so poor, first of all, and so, so little of it is done. You know, if there's about five times as much research on erectile dysfunction, which affects about 20% of all men versus PMS that affects 90% of all people who menstruate. Just saying. Find out what's the truth for you. And the best way to do this is using menstrual planners and just tracking yourself and your symptoms at different parts of your cycle. So I am putting together a menstrual planner and we'll probably we'll include that for free with the, the hormones masterclass when that comes out but you can get an app on your phone you can just write it down in a notebook every day what day of your cycle you're on how you're feeling what you're eating what's happening from a digestive perspective and um, how you feel in terms of motivation sleep uh, but exercise and performance could go in there as well so just knowing yourself is super important so anyway, that's why you might get more diarrhea and gas during your period. Um, there were quite a few questions on premenstrual tension and um, premenstrual dysphoric disorder. And I think that merits a separate video. So I'm just going to park those questions and we'll come back to those in a full video about those. Increased prolapse symptoms in the lead up to menstruation, even when objective examination doesn't change. Well, gravity first of all okay so here we go now this is a nice small uterus so probably early follicular phase coming up to just before the period that uterus so here's the uterus here's the vagina we'll leave the bladder here the uterus is going to go from a small organ it's going to get much bigger and heavier and fuller because it is because the uterine lining has expanded and it's it's in case you're pregnant it needs to be ready to have a baby friendly environment ready for implantation and growth so the uterus gets bigger and heavier it's pressing on the bladder because you know those two are like this so here's your bladder uterus and vagina so if this is big and heavy it's going to be pushing down like that and that's really what gives us those that feeling of heaviness or dragging that we might associate with increased prolapse symptoms coming up to the period. Um, bladder leakage in the week up to the period. So same thing to a degree, you know, you've got uterus over the bladder, bigger and heavier than it is at the rest of the cycle. So that's pressing down. So if you don't have good support mechanism underneath, hang on, let me get my bits and bobs here. There we go. So here are your pelvic floor muscles. Okay, so we've got the pelvic floor muscles trying to support from below. We've got the ligaments supporting from above. And remember as well that changing levels of estrogen 
are going to affect muscles, ligaments, and connective tissue as well. But gravity is going to be pressing down on the bladder and just means that along with the effect on the sphincters because of lower estrogen, um, all of those can be just the perfect storm coupled with a little bit of digestive upset if the rectum is irritated by all these prostaglandins as well, it can be a recipe for increased stress urinary incontinence. What can you do about it? Make sure you are emptying your bowel. Are you eating well? We'll talk about food cravings in a sec. Um, are you eating well? Are you having a good daily bowel movement? Um, are you practicing your pelvic floor muscle training strategies? Are you doing a squeeze before you sneeze and you know activating the pelvic floor muscles when you're going from sit to stand or you're coughing or you're sneezing or you're lifting? Um, and just all of the all of the strategies that we we talk about a lot on this channel and on my my social media, just to be aware that you might need a little bit of extra awareness in the week coming up to your period in terms of leaking. Um, hunger and cravings. So why do we get hunger and cravings? Well, we talked a little bit about that um, when we were talking about progesterone and prostaglandins. So remember around day 14, from day 14 at ovulation through the second half of your cycle into that luteal phase before you start bleeding again, uh, progesterone is going to be rising. Now progesterone can increase appetite. Why? The clue is in the name, progest. So think about gestation. Progesterone is a pro-pregnancy hormone. So it's trying to prepare you in case you're pregnant. Um, so it's going to start looking at taking in extra calories to build a, be build a better uterus. Um, and you can have some increase in appetite. In contrast, in the first half of the cycle, estrogen can by itself act as a bit of an appetite suppressant. But second half of the cycle, you're coming up to the, the peak and the, then the, the decline of your luteal phase uh, if you're not pregnant, and both progesterone and estrogen drop. So serotonin and dopamine are going to be affected as well. And that means that mood can drop as well in that premenstrual early part of bleeding slash early follicular phase. And when mood is low or when we're stressed or we're anxious and we don't have the calming effect of progesterone because it's also a calming hormone um, or the mood stabilizing effect of estrogen, cortisol goes up. Cortisol drives appetite. Cortisol is one of our main stress hormones and cortisol increases your cravings for food that are high in sugar and in salt, uh, sugar, sorry, sugar and fat. So cakes, biscuits, chocolate. Does anybody ever have any cravings for chocolate when they're premenstrual or early cycle? So it's a normal reaction hormonally to what's happening, but we want to think about what can we do so if you try to just stick with low fat foods they're not very satisfying and it's going to drive the craving for sugary foods even more so this is about listening to your hormones listening and obeying but being just a little canny in, in how you're obeying so you want to think about healthy high fat foods that you can have so i'm thinking about things like hummus guacamole but you know what have a piece of dark chocolate have two pieces of dark chocolate if you want, um, but have them mindfully and pay attention. And also maybe have a look at what else could bring you comfort. You know, not just bowls of mashed potatoes, although, but what else is comforting for you? Is it curled up on the couch with a blanket and a good book? Is it doing some yoga? Is it getting out and going for a walk by yourself? You know, Think about what you can do to really just nurture yourself. Estrogen and progesterone are super low. And, you know, once you get past day three of your period, estrogen will start to rise again. You will feel better. But how can you be nice to yourself? And this is very much about listening to what your body is telling you and respecting it. We will talk in the next video more about how your energy changes throughout the cycle and what you can do to honor that. 
um, whether we're talking about work or sport um, and how that might affect training. So we will talk about that in an upcoming video as well. But hopefully these few questions and answers will get you thinking. Um, what do we need to remember? What we're eating really, really influences hormonal health. How we're managing our stress is super important. If you're not sleeping, that's going to have a huge effect on both hormonal balance, but also on appetite control as well, because your two main hormones that control appetite and satiety, that feeling of fullness, leptin and ghrelin, are very much affected by sleep. We know disrupted sleep is linked to increased weight gain, particularly around the middle of our body. So it's keeping our hormones happy and healthy, getting rid of the estrogen that no longer serves us, so good bowel health. Primarily, you know, the research really supports a primarily plant-based, healthy whole food diet. So, you know, using whole grains, your veg, aiming for your 30 different plants a week, really important. Um, but it's listening, it's tuning in, it's obeying, and it's tracking what's happening with your cycle. So what I will do for our next video is I'll talk through the planner that I've made for you with the help of the captive teenager. And we will talk through how we can use that. And again, just listening and respecting how our energy ebbs and flows throughout the cycle. And of course, we'll do then another video on PMT, PMS, PMDD, all the abbreviations. Hope that's helpful. If you have any questions, uh, pop them in the comments below or tag me on social media. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for all the questions. And I will see you next time. Remember, celebrate women, celebrate health, celebrate your muliabrity. Bye for now.